Hi everyone, I'm Rick Benson, you are from In The Know Trader. And today I wanna to introduce you to a brand new report that we're coming out with launching on Saturday, August 1st, and it'll come out the first of each month going forward. We call it 7-Eleven, and this is a spider ETF sector report that will go through the 11 macro S&P ETF uh, ETFs. And the goal here, uh, what we're going to do is try to outperform the S&P 500. And we're going to do that by investing in no more than seven of the 11 macro sectors at any one time. And the goal here is to attempt to stay away from the underperforming sectors. So let's say we put on at any given time, anywhere from as little as four to as many as seven of the spider ETFs. What are those? Those are the ones that start with XL. So for instance, XLE is energy, XLP is consumer staples, XLK is technology. Of course, you know there are 11 of these different macro sector ETFs and combined, they completely um, give you the performance of the spider, the SPY. But you know that because there are 11 sectors and certain sectors outperform, certain sectors stay with the market, they're kind of neutral to the performance of the S&P. And then there's always some sectors that underperform the S&P. And our goal is to keep you into the ones that look the best or certainly are neutral to positive against the S&P and avoid the underperformers. So this report is completely about relative performance. And the, this is the relative performance of those 11 macro sector ETFs to the S&P itself. It is not about absolute performance. It is not about picking an ETF that is going to go up or going to go down. It is about doing better than the broad S&P does. So we can be in a sector, uh, let's say, let's just say, for example, we're long uh, consumer discretionary names, XLY. And now let's say the whole market comes off and so does XLY. As long as XLY does not fall in percentage terms more than the S&P, then you're actually having an outperformer. So we're not saying it's important to know which way the market is going. It is simply, and the entire report from start to finish is completely based upon relative performance of the S&P. So this game of trying to outperform is exactly what traditional long only mutual fund portfolio managers do for a living. They don't have the luxury of being completely out of a sector. They are generally involved in all 11 sectors of the market. If this is, a, a, let's say, a mutual fund that's benchmarked to the S&P and trying to do better than it. So it can't, for instance, totally eliminate a sector. What a PM can do is underweight the sector uh, relative to the benchmark performance. So let's just say, for example, um, let's say the energy sector of the S&P uh, is made up of, we'll say it's 4% of the total S&P. Um, so if a PM doesn't really want to be fully involved, he may only have 3 or 2% in energy, but he's not going to go or she's not going to go to 0%. They still need to be involved in all sectors of the market. What we have the ability to do is to attempt to eliminate the underperformers. And if we can do that, so for instance, in the last, uh, certainly in 2020, energy has been the worst performing of the 11 sectors. Um, and it, such was the case also in 2019. On the flip side, technology was the best performing sector in 2019, and it continues to be the best performing sector this year. So if you had been in technology and not in energy, and let's say you were in, let's say you were in all uh, 
every sector except energy, you're still going to outperform the S&P because you were not in the worst performer. And although energy only takes up three or 4% of the full S&P, you'd certainly, you'd outperform, but you wouldn't be, you wouldn't outperform and crush the market's performance because the sector you avoided was only, let's say, 3%. But if you go through all 11 sectors of the market and pick the best ones and eliminate the worst ones, you will mathematically outperform the market. And that is what our goal is, is to, on an annual basis, outperform the same return that the spiders would have. So how do we do this? Well, here's, here's how, and this is everything we look at are samples only here. Uh, so do not use these. Um, as ways to judge what to do. These are pure samples. So what we're going to do is uh, the first section in this report is going to look at both the uh, absolute price of a particular sector. So in this case, let's say technology. So this is XLK and we'll run models on it and we'll put uh, trend lines and moving averages and anything else that needs to be on a chart to help you um, decipher what's going on. And then we're also on the lower half, uh, or, or actually it's more than half, we give more room allocated to the relative performance. Because again, this entire report is about relative performance. So this is the XLK divided by the spiders. And you can see it's been moving higher, which means the XLK is outperforming the spiders. Recently, obviously it's pulled back. This is the sample only. But this is um, what we would mostly concentrate on. So I will give you the charts of, of XLK outright, but what we're really going to focus on is the relative performance and to determine over the next three to six months whether or not you still want to be um, overweight, equal, or underweight any one of these particular 11 spider ETFs. And if I say, if they're underweight, then their chances are they're not going to be included. They will be the ones. Um, so when we have bearish looking charts, and we'll get to that shortly, um, then we'll say that that's not a sector that needs to be in the four, five, six, or seven that we're going to have on at any one time. Um, on the left hand side here, I'll give you some tidbits about the absolute price, as well as some information about the relative price. Here we'll, uh, again, sample only, let's say I was neutral utilities. Um, well, again, we're gonna show you the chart on top. We're also gonna show you the relative chart. And here, let's say if this was the actual call, it would be neutral, maybe even bearish to neutral, um, or new, yeah, probably something more like bearish to neutral. Um, and again, we'll analyze the relative performance and clearly for the bulk, well, the first, uh, so far, the first quarter of this year, uh, looks like utilities outperformed. And then um, since then, they've underperformed. And the goal here, again, is to figure out where are those turning points? Where do we want to put exposure on into a sector that's going to outperform the market? And where are we going to identify something that need not be um, in the portfolio because it's going to underperform? I'll give one last example to this. And that is, let's say, a bearish looking chart. So again, uh, sample only, let's say this was uh, energy uh, outright basis, obviously strong underperformer. In fact, kind of looks like 2016 was an up year, but energy has been underperforming since. So this is gonna be a negative looking uh, chart. And again, so let's say we would not put, we would not allocate any of the portfolio to energy. We don't have to, again, we don't have the restrictions that a typical portfolio manager would. So the goal of this is, uh, of this report is to simply stay away from those sectors that look like they're going to underperform. Uh, so we will go through all 11 sectors of the S&P, just like the three I showed you now, we will go through all 11, just like this, showing you absolute terms, how it looks, showing you relative terms. And again, I just put letters in here uh, to show you there'll be bullet points worth of information relating to these charts, as well as, for instance, what my call would be for that sector. Everything I remind you in this um, 
broadcast is sample only. Do not take any of this as actual recommendations. Not even all these charts line up to being what I'm telling you there to be. They are simply samples of what we're going to have. Also further in this report, we will take a look at the year-to-date performance. So um, you, you, you'll get a uh, screen that shows you both year-to-date as well as how each sector is year-to-date. Um, and you, it gives you a chance to look at what's doing best. So of course, the zero line is a great chart from stockcharts.com that shows you uh, going back to January 1st, or essentially the close of December 31st, how each one of the sectors did on a relative basis versus the zero line. So anything that's above the zero line has outperformed the S&P. Anything that's beneath has underperformed. And you can see um, just how bad some of these sectors are. Um, so um, this, this gives you that type of view. We'll, of course, include the relative rotation graph um, of the S&P. And typically, I'm going to look at a 13-week period because that represents one quarter of a year. So a rolling quarter uh, gives you enough time that it's not being affected dramatically by exactly what's going on now. But we get to look at the progress uh, of what's been happening over a rolling quarter. Uh, and then I also will sort the relative performance uh, in terms of best to worst versus the S&P over that time period. So again, in this particular example, ending on July 27th, the spiders have been up 15.5% in the last 13 weeks. Uh, consumer discretionary has been the best name, up 22 and so on, down to energy, which is still up, but only up just barely 6%. Now, this slide, I've had to cover virtually everything for because I was in the process of putting it together for launch uh, on August 1st. So I've covered over um, the essentials here. But what I want to tell you is this will be included. And um, this is something that took me literally a couple hours to do because um, what I've done here is created a grid, and it's, it's, I've had to black it out, uh, but what I want you to know is each box in the grid is looked at. So here we're going to look at, and I'm going to tell you this, you read this chart from left to right. This grid is from left to right, not the, not the columns, but the rows. So we're going to look at materials versus, well, XLB is materials. That box, just like here, consumer discretionary versus XLY consumer discretionary is going to be blank. Otherwise, um, every one of these boxes is going to have a color code of how each sector is versus the other 10 sectors. And it can be anywhere from bullish, which is bright green, to bearish, which is bright red. And the um, steps in between. So if I'm bullish to somewhat neutral, it'll have a lighter green. If it's neutral to bullish, it'll get grayer, getting towards neutral, which is gray. Then neutral to bearish is still, it's, it's in the red family, but it's, you can tell it's fairly grayed, uh, which gives you the hint that it's, it's predominantly neutral. If I am bearish to neutral, it is a deeper red, and then the bright red is the most bearish. So each box here in this grid that's 11 by 11 is going to have how each one of these sectors matches up against the other any one of these other sectors. And again, this took a lot of time to do because I manually do each one of these. Um, so... There are times there might be a slight inconsistency between, let's say, what materials versus XLRE was. So if I go to uh, XLRE, which is real estate, and then find materials, it may not be the inverse color. It almost always is, but there are times that when you flip a chart, I actually get a slightly different reading um, on uh, some of the models I use. So it's never more than one step away from what it was. But the important thing here, and, and I've had several people ask me to do something like this because this is for those of you who like to pair trade. It'll help you line up which one of these sectors are best to trade versus other sectors. 
And so it, it takes it a step beyond what the report is doing because it also lines you up pair trades. Um, so you can see, for instance, if you want it to be, let's say, long health care, um, and let's say financials, if we go to where this grid uh, would be, and let's say this showed up right um, green, then it would mean that healthcare is very bullish versus financial. So you might want to go long XLV, and instead of just being long XLV, you can short XLF against it. And that, of course, takes the uh, direction of the market out of the equation. Uh, by having pair trades on, you greatly diminish the risk that you have on when you have on an outright position because you have a, some type of matching short against it. And by having a matching short against it, what that allows you to, to do is perform regardless of which way the market goes, right? Once you have a pair trade on, it's a long versus a short. And plenty of people do this in stocks. Um, I, I don't know the percentage of hedge funds, but it is a large percentage of hedge funds are what they call long short funds. Um, the, the principals of the firm know that their portfolio managers can't always get the direction of the market correctly. So it's not about just being long when you think the market's going up. Uh, certainly the market can come off any time. We've seen it take a look what happened in March of uh, 2020. Um, and if you were simply long, you get crushed. By having a short on that's either in the same family of stocks, meaning let's say you were long um, a restaurant like um, Darden and short McDonald's. And again, not saying that's the right thing to do. These are all examples. You have a pair trade on, in the restaurant industry, and they tend to move with each other. But if you've done your homework, and let's say you've decided that over time, Darden has the stronger um, company, it, its stock should do better over time, then you'd pick something that you think will not do as well, and you create a pair trade. Uh, that's like uh, Home Depot versus Lowe's, uh, Coke versus Pepsi and so on. Um, so a good portion of the hedge fund industry simply does longs versus shorts because they don't want to uh, get wiped out just trying to pick which ones are do, going to do best in a bull market. They also have to be hedged in case the market comes off. So this particular um, slide that will come in, in the report each month is going to line up each sector against all the other remaining 10 sectors to give you possible pair trades that you can use to put on. Also within this slide, and I'll just show you the top of it, the rest I've blacked out, is the actual percentage that, for instance, materials make in the S&P. They're only 3%. Um, Obviously, technology is, I don't know, I'm guessing 28% or something in that neighborhood, uh, a much bigger weighting. So um, even when we, let's say we included materials into our report um, as being one of the um, several ETFs that we, we would have, if we included materials, it's because we think it would do at least as well as the S&P, if not better. And, but realize it's only 3% of the total portfolio. So because we even eliminate um, several sectors each time, and we'll always have uh, eliminate you no know, less than four of the 11, we'll need to reallocate our percentages such that um, we will actually be overweight certain sectors of the market. Um, because of the mathematics involved and only being involved in a certain amount of them. Now, here's another um, whole uh, type of information that uh, is unique to this report. And I've included one of my most trusted quant models into this report. And this is the first piece we'll look at it. There's more as we, as we, uh, finish looking at more of what's included. But just to give you an example, this will go through all 11 sectors. Um, 
In this case, it's, we'll, we'll show you the material sector. The quant model is neutral on the sector. And what it'll do is also, I will give you what the quant model says are the best subgroups within materials and the least favorable subgroups within materials. So here, for example, let's say steel is a favored group and forest products are an unfavored group. You can, again, if you're going to uh, get down to the stock level and go beyond this report's ETF investing of, let's say, just using XLB to represent materials, so many of you like trading stocks, well, this will list the uh, multiple subgroups within the material section that show up favorably in the quant model. And for instance, steel is favorable, forest products is unfavorable. That means you can line up stocks, excuse me, that are steel stocks. Um, let's say like an Alcoa, for instance, is a steel stock, a steel stock, and then pair that versus a forest product. Um, let's say like a warehouse or, or some, something that's known for forest products. Um, so you can create pair trades of being long, a favorable and short and unfavorable. Realize they're all within materials, they're all within a group. Um, so they'll tend to trade similarly, but this is a way again of being able to pick the better sectors uh, within a subgroup versus the less favorable ones. And we will do this, you will get a list all 11 sectors, um, sector by sector, and then subgroup by subgroup, which ones show up favorable and which ones show up unfavorable. Then, um, so this is great for people who want uh, pair trades. And again, I've gotten lots of requests for that. Uh, moving on in this report, this is only partially filled out and it's completely random what I've put in there. So again, do not take any of this to be my calls. Um, we will fill in the entire box. Every slot will be filled in. And this will be ultimately what you take away from each report as far as where we're going to be invested. So let's say we're looking at materials and my technical rating ends up being neutral. Let's say the quant model calls it neutral. Well, in that case, we're probably not going to be into uh, using that as one of the um, sectors we choose to be in. Let's say that commercial services um, bearish to neutral, the quant model, let's say is bullish. Uh, well, we may put in a certain percent into um, that ETF of, of XLC. And what I'm going to do also is give you the actual percent that all these will ultimately total up to 100. So whether we are in as little as four or as many as seven, when we go through each one of these sectors, you'll get a technical rating from me and the models I use. You'll get a quant model rating and then I will determine how much you want to be um, long or not involved in a particular sector. Let's say, again, for example, let's say I had a technical bearish rating uh, on industrials, and let's say the quant model was bearish industrials. Well, then that's not going to be one of the four to seven or so of the ETFs we're gonna be in. But let's say I was bullish utilities and the quant model was bullish utilities, then we're gonna be long and I'll give you again the percent. So if we had seven of these, they're still gonna all add up to 100% because at any one time, we're gonna have 100% of your money working um, in the sectors that we think are going to outperform the market. So this report also gives you both a the, the walk away each month is going to be a combination of technicals and a um, my favorite of all quant models. Um, and uh, I, I, I can't give you more details on this other than I can tell you that it's, it's a very important part of how I look at the markets is to also get a sense uh, of what uh, the quant model is. The one thing I can tell you is that the quant model has to do with analyst ratings and when they get too skewed in one direction. Um, 
this model tends to be able to uh, see forward and figure out when uh, you're going to get a, a change in those ratings. And of course, once analysts start changing their ratings and they collectively start doing that, you'll often see a total change uh, in direction of the underlying security. So it doesn't necessarily take the first one. Let's, let's just say a particular uh, sector or, or stocks within a sector had, uh, I don't know, let's just call it 80% of the analysts on the street were, bear, were, were bullish certain names. And then at some point, some uh, analyst starts downgrading uh, from buy to hold or, or hold to even sell. Um, that's the first person, but eventually that stuff often starts to steamroll. And you, then you see the uh, portfolio managers adjusting their portfolios based upon consensus on the street. And what this model does is get you a very good clue into when that process is starting. And again, it kind of tends to uh, give you about a one month forward look before it starts uh, pulling together. So uh, it's a very helpful tool uh, in order to figure out how we're going to be allocated. The last thing I want to show you that uh, is going to be included um, is a S&P 1500 constituent book. What's the S&P 1500? It's the large cap, which is the S&P 500. It's the mid cap, which is the S&P 400. And it's the small cap, which is the S&P 600. Uh, so these are the 1500 uh, biggest stocks traded in the US. Um, and what I will show you, and this is just a small piece of a, I don't know, some 30 page uh, attachment. Um, and it'll be sent as a, a separate attachment to um, subscribers, is you will see sector by sector. Uh, so within energy, you will see there's only, for instance, one company in the S&P 500 that's in the energy space, and that's Schlumberger. Um, in the S&P 400, you have um, Transocean in the oil and gas uh, drilling subsector, and you have Champion X in oil and gas equipment and services. And then in a small cap, you can see all these names. Well, this is just a few, but we will um, give you all 1,500 names that make up the S&P as they're categorized by large, big cap, and small, so that when you see that I've got, for instance, we, we go back to that example I showed you um, here. And let's say if you went into the materials piece of that constituents book, you could actually look at what names are in steel. You could look at what names are in forest products. Therefore, you'd be able to know uh, which names to choose from to be on the long side and which ones to be uh, able to be on the short side. And again, this all fits into the idea of um, of relative performance. So this whole this whole report, and we're going to, this 7-Eleven report is all about um, relative performance. And our focus is on the 11 macro ETFs, but we will give you uh, certain information in order to um, even be able to do some pair trades. Now, you've got to do your fundamental work on the pair trades, but I can tell you, at least from you know, the quant side, how things um, show up. So that's the 7-Eleven report. It launches August 1st. We'll come out each first of the month going forward. And for more information, go to inthenotrader.com to sign up and you'll see pricing and everything that's related to this report. I'm Rick Bensignor. Thanks much. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.